Welcome to the final session of Lady Coders Vampire. Get ahead. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for making it this far. Folks, what we have here are distinguished and very valued members of the recruitment community. These are folks who are going to be able to not just maybe hire you, but answer questions about how to get hired in different levels and areas of the industry. Now, Shannon earlier today gave you some information about what the nature of, a, of being a recruiter is like. Now you can ask these folks what you need to do to get the job from them, okay? So what we have here, first of all, let me see. We have Rodney DeLorean. Rodney DeLorean is from Robert Half Technologies. We have Tara Gowland, who is here from Startup Recruit. We've got Will Chan from eGraphs. And of course, you remember Shannon Anderson earlier from New West Staffing. All right, so Shannon's gonna go ahead and moderate our panel, and we're gonna open this up to questions. So as you uh, raise your hand and get called on by Shannon, please make sure and tell these, these kind of folks your name, okay? All right, take it away, Shannon. Um, well, thank you, and thanks everybody for the great lunch session, that was fun. And I realized that there were a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of perceptions that I wasn't aware of. Um, one of the perceptions that, that the group had, many of you had to have negative experiences with recruiters. And um, so I wondered if there were any questions that you could ask of this panel that would help you see maybe the brighter side of uh, working with recruiters, particularly recruiters that are outside of companies. Kind of, I think everybody here is an external recruiter, right? Agency, you're inside. That's right. Um, so there's one good guy here. <laughs> so that, I think that's actually perfect. So is there anything that came up at lunch you guys like to? I have one uh, very vague question. Why why should I go with the recruiter instead of going straight to the company I want to work for? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Does anybody want to take that? Yeah, that's bad. And, I, and I'll start off by saying that I actually work only with startups, companies that don't have any internal recruitment or HR personnel. So if you want to get to that founder, the only way to do that is through me. And that's a unique situation, because usually if you're dealing with an agency such as Robert Half, usually bigger companies, you can go a different direction than a bigger company, but that's just kind of my own background. I've been in recruiting and started off in contingency search, like Robert Half, about 15 years ago. Why you want to go through a recruiter, a good recruiter, and of course, you, I'm sure you guys talked about what a bad recruiter is, but a good recruiter who's effective, who knows your market, is going to understand your fit, who you are, what you bring to the table on the, talent, on, the, on the talent side, but also what your fit is individually. Do you fit into a startup? Are you better in a small organization, big organization? What is your passion? And it's hard for a hiring manager to, to know how to get to that. So somebody who's been trained and who's experienced in evaluating what the full person is, not just what's the skill or what's a resume, which is fairly useless, but what really makes, you know, what makes you you, and then finding that right match. It's not about filling up, you know, plugging a person into a hole, into an opportunity. It's about finding, in my opinion, my opinion has always been, you start with the candidate first. And it's not a candidate, it's a person that happens to not basically be 100% happy where they're at. So why do you want to do a good recruiter? Because you you don't possibly know all the positions that are available. You may want to target certain companies, but you don't know how to get in. You don't have the introductions. You know, And with third party, usually they're motivated by obviously partially funds, you know, they're, getting, they're getting paid to do this, but also they're, they're a service provider, they're a consultant. So they, they feel a, a personal drive to fulfill that company's needs. And so if they don't fill those positions, whether they're one of five, 10 agencies or not, you know, it's a personal commitment for them to do that. So they're looking at you, they're looking at the company and deciding if, if it's the right match. And if it's, if it's a bad recruiter, well, I'm sure you guys know what can happen. But if it's a good recruiter, the worst that could happen is you just don't get the job. Mm -hmm. The best recruiters, you have an ally with you throughout your career. Yeah. You know, so six or seven years later, you can call them up and say, yeah, you know, there's been outsourcing and there's been outplacement and I now don't have a job. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. Or your buddy needs a position. You now have a trusted advisor, you know, that you can keep throughout your career. Yeah, exactly right. And, and another thing where, where I look at it is um, it's a mutual beneficial like relationship because there are jobs out there like she said that you guys wouldn't know about that we would know about and um, there are skills that you guys have that you know about but we don't know about so it's kind of 
a marketing arm for each other. So a lot of times, um, again, with a good recruiter, um, they'll help you get your culture fit. Um, I call it quality of life within the company. Mm -hmm. So like if you guys are sit down, head down with developers, I'm trying to find a new company like that. If you'd like to bring your dog, I try to find a company you know, also. <laughs> there are different things. I mean, there's a ton of companies that let you bring your dog to the office. So yeah, a good recruiter would look for that stuff. Um, we don't look for hired guns, as like a lot of people think that recruiters look for a hired gun guy that's like developing for so many years. Uh, we look for that when the company asks for it, but in general, we look for, you know, we want people to get jobs. It's rewarding when people get jobs. Um, and we want them to continue a relationship with us mm -hmm. so that five years from now, when you guys are mid level developers, you come back to us and say, hey, you know, I'm a mid level developer now, you know, iOS, um, Android, <coughs> what do you guys have for me? So, yeah. Because our job is getting, to, it's, it's really finding out who that client is. And mm -hmm. not just the company, but also that particular hiring manager. Like if you look at a company like Microsoft or Amazon, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hiring managers. You may only fit in specific areas. Not because right. of what you do, but because of who you are in particular. So when you ask people, why are you unhappy in your position? That's the magic question we always ask. If you're, just, if you're calling a prospect, and you know they're not actively looking. Again, in the middle of the day, 8 o'clock at night, whatever, the question is, what would you change if there's anything you would change? And there's always something. There's always something. I'm commuting three hours a day. You know, my boss is 10 years younger than me, and I'm not going anywhere, whatever that is. So by finding those things out and getting to know your client really well at an individual level, none of this, I'm throwing my resume into a database, and no one will ever call me. You know, it, it, it's making sure you understand your client and your, your, the person actually doing the work you know, the need and the, the product, you get to know who those people are and you're putting them together, you're plugging them in like an outlet. Yeah, it's like a puzzle. Like that's right. what we talk about, it's like a puzzle putting the right person to the right job. So I mean a lot of companies, um, one in particular looks for big fit, um, uh, South Lake Union company. Mm -hmm. um, they really look for a fit. You could be the best developer in the world, but if you're not a fit for their department mm -hmm. or for that particular position you'll be on their wait list forever until they find the right fit for you. So I'm um, on their wait list forever right now. Yeah. <laughs> so we try and find the right, the right person for the right job. You know, you have a decent track record, I, I think, <laughs> I, would, I would like to say. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, was, yeah. that was, thank you very much. Um, and that was kind of the answer I was hoping you were going to give. Because um, that was my fear, thinking about looking for a job. Um, I never thought I ever had like special needs before, but um, now I do. I don't want to commute, um, and I want to like where I go five days a week. So that suddenly has become a special need. As long as you trust your recruiter, I mean, it's like anything else. It's like you're going on a date. You want to make sure that person's exactly. on that job. Yeah. You know, you ask them. <laughs> you know, tell me. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, and I've had people call me about recruiting jobs, and I'm an entrepreneur. I own a business, so that's not going to happen. And I found that after 15 years of doing this, I'm actually pretty unemployable by the greater... <laughs> <laughs> Yay! But that kind of sucks because there's not a lot of stability when you're in your own business. But, you know, you want to ask them questions. Tell me about the last replacements you made. You know, do behavioral questioning. Ask them, you know, when was the last time you had a candidate that wasn't happy with your performance? What was the situation? What was the result? You turn it around on them. Can, you I, know? can I go out and have coffee with them? It, you would sure. demand it, and if they refuse oh. to meet with you, and of course that would be not better for me. To oh yeah, I would personally. I would not work with. It's just like anything else. Are you gonna, you know, are you really going to do business with somebody that you have no clue who they are? Right. This is why, you know, if you get the same, if you have different recruiters calling you on the same job, it's first of all the company and it, hiring is broken. Let's just say this. It could be a four-hour conversation. But let's say even if, let's say it's a fifty-person startup, and you have five agencies calling you. There's a problem internally. It's not the agency's fault. It's the company not knowing how they're managing, oh. you know, how to manage their process. And do they have to have an internal recruiter? No. But then internal recruiters have other issues. Internal recruiters are not out there really learning the market. They're too busy managing all the flow of people coming in and basically just looking at a database and going check, 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 no, 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 because there's no time. That's more like a hiring manager. Mm -hmm. so. That's like well, a hiring manager. And right. let me segue right. that. Thank you. We talked about that a bunch a little bit, sort of filtering out. Um, but Will, you're an intern, so you're you work as I'm a recruiter, an and you're a software engineer. Yeah, I saw that.
So talk to us about your perspective on this. So I've been working for seven years at um, other programming jobs. And a year ago, I co-founded eGraphs. Um, you can check us out at eGraphs.com. And so the, I think the unique, pers unique perspective that I can provide is on is on the actual interviews themselves, because I've been interviewed a lot of times, and I've been the interviewer in many cases. And so, I mean, is that something that you're interested in hearing about? Yeah, OK, cool. So the way that I think about it is, is um, it's, a, it's a nervous situation when you go into a technical interview. Um, easy, easy problems that you'll get you know, could trip you up. But don't worry. Just, Practice makes perfect. The way that to think about it is that um, you know you might have you might have four or five technical interviews on site, and let's say that you know you've you've you made it past the phone screen, your resume has been picked up, you're you're on site, and so your job that day is is twofold. One is the technical, and the other side is the fit. The technical you could think of it as you want to pass a barrier right, and pass pass a a threshold. So no one's no one's expecting perfection, but assuming you know your stuff, um, you know, that's 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 your goal is is to pass that threshold and make sure that you've convinced your interviewers that you have the, the technical competence to, to do the job. And beyond that, that's the fit. And fit in a technical interview that involves programming problems. Each hour-long interview, it's it's kind of tricky, but it's there. It's it's in how you it's ha it's in how you interact with your interviewers. Um, for example, let's say that you got thrown really hard problem on how do you how do you make sure that your your web cache is never in, out of sync with your database. It's a pretty hard problem, right? It's pretty specialized. You should ask them. And whoever passes, you can. <laughs> Anybody know the answer? Anybody know how to value catches? Um, well, it's a it's a tough problem that involves um, race conditions and all that stuff. The point of it is that you're not you're expected to not have that background beforehand, and you're supposed to struggle with it. And the worst thing you could do is to give up. The best thing you could do is to keep trying is to keep trying and convey to your interviewers that when faced with a, a tough problem, you're, the, you're gonna be the kind of engineer, you're gonna be the kind of tech professional who keeps thinking about it, different angles. And, and, and your interviewer is gonna try to steer you towards certain solutions, right? certain approaches. Listen to those, don't just, you know, I've, I've seen people, they, they you know, I gotta give them credit. They, they, they. I give them a hint, and they'll just ignore it and keep going. The direction. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of cool. I mean, they, they had something to chase, um, and, and but most of the time, you know, the interviewers know the problem really well because <laughs> they've given it a dozen times already. Um, so, you know, probably your best bet is to be receptive to the hints that you're given. And respond positively, and try to think thoughtfully about that direction. And that itself is another is another fit indicator for your interviewers. It's an indication that that <laughs> so you know programming is not just working by yourself. Programming is working on a team, and your teammates, your future teammates, will want to know that you're a positive, thoughtful, receptive person to work with. Who doesn't give up? And one thing I like to tell candidates with that particular type of question or that particular situation is a lot of the people like you know, they're looking for people with aptitude rather than knowing that knowing. They're looking for people that would learn and figure out how to, you know, be perceptive like of the questions that he's asking and how he's moving you. Because when you're on a team you guys are gonna be doing that and you're gonna go in one direction or another and you have to be, you know, have the aptitude to learn um, in order to succeed as a developer. And that's one of the biggest things as far as developers go. If they have the aptitude to learn, um, a lot of times they pass the first technical screen and go to the next one, even if they, they're not the best developer in the world. So just, you know, that, that's a big 
big advice. Well, startups too. I mean, startups aren't going to have that magical. Here's my 90 checklist, mm -hmm. you know, requirement list. They're going to say, okay, what's the absolute minimum we can get away with? Because a, maybe they don't have the funding or the revenue stream just yet, but also because they're risk takers themselves and they know how to take risk on somebody. Now it's a big risk because if the person hasn't done something before. But that's why whenever you go into an interview, you always want to think to yourself, okay, let's manage this interview. Don't let the other person interview you. Most people in interview don't know what they're doing. So what you try and think of is what are their problems? What could their problems be? And have some case studies, have some, some ideas for them. You know, I haven't done this, but here's how I would handle something like this, which is why they ask behavioral questions in the first place. Give me an example when you did this. You know, a big company, they're going to have it down. I mean, I, I, in, in this building, there was a company where he went from one guy, ex-Microsoft, Lifer, who started a gaming company, who was hiring his first developer. And real life story, really funny, because I said, and I won't tell you who it is, they're a great company, but <laughs> let's see he, if we can guess. He had <laughs> learned, oh, God, I'm sure there's about three companies in the fit this bill. I said, you know, I understand that you learned at Microsoft how to interview. But I want you to just throw that in the garbage. Why, 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 why? It's worked for me. I said, well, because it really doesn't work. All you're doing is just finding out, does the person have this experience? And you're only paying X, they're not going to have this experience. We found you a dozen people, you know, that have 30% or 40%. This is the startup world, right? Smaller companies that they can't afford to ask for the world and back again. Unless they're a co-founder, and then they're talking to you directly, and that's another issue altogether. But you know, and he was very blank, and I said, you're not really showing enough engagement. You're gonna scare these, they're kids, they're younger candidates, you're gonna scare them off, and he's like, oh. And I said, it's not Microsoft. You know, find out who these people are. And without giving too much away, the person that he hired, he had reservations about, for a few reasons. And I said, you gotta take a risk. This person's willing to take a risk. They have this experience. They may not be perfect, but you you know you've got a probation period. You know, yep. bigger companies can take those risks, yep. and they can hire tons of people, and they don't work out. It's not a huge deal. But a small, I mean, going from a three-person company really to ten mm -hmm. is like climbing Mount Everest. Yeah. You know, but they've got to take that risk, and it's you know. So when you interview with startups, just be careful because sometimes they get like, okay, this is my idea. It's got to be just perfect, and you have to say, you have to say, I understand. Like a counselor. If you want to be a therapist, <laughs> I understand this is your baby, but here's how I'm going to get you to where you're going. And I haven't done all of it, but if I'm not, if I can't do it, then you can just can me, and I'll go find a job at a big company if that's you know if that's what's going to happen. You know, and they usually go okay. You know, so they're not always looking for that perfect candidate. There is no such thing. I mean, what's a resume anyway? Yeah, it's, it's right? fit. Everything's fit nowadays. Um, it's, it's fit how you can work with the team, how you can fit into the culture. Of that particular company, you know, there's companies like Microsoft that have a particular culture, and there's a company like a couple of that I work with that are smaller companies that want the total opposite of Microsoft. You know, they, they want someone that can write their own scripts rather than just press a button to, to do a test. They want someone to write their own test harnesses rather than just you know double click the test harnesses that's created. So sometimes when they see that Microsoft resume, you know, like up and down, they go, mm. no, maybe not. Um, we'll, we'll switch to the next person. So. And, and yeah. yeah. This so is interesting, and it, it's an indicator of why, when you're working with the right recruiter, that recruiter can advocate for you. They can right. go to bat for you and talk to the company about why you'd be a great candidate, you know, based on the total fit versus the, can the companies, in, you know, um, you know, oftentimes they'll just default to the checklist, you know, filtering out, filtering out. So the recruiter can help you get filtered in. You can get you in front of the... Yeah. person, and then after that it's up to you guys to... Yeah. It's trust. So if you're meeting a recruiter and you think, gosh, this is something I, I would put my life behind, then believe me, they're going to say to that employer, they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to send you two people, but this is the guy you're going to hire. And I've had stories where I had an employer, this is in Canada and Toronto, where they said to me, we only hire men in this position. <laughs> and I said, why is that? Oh, I thought you guys would like this. <laughs> I said, why is that? Well, because it's all, okay, this is a good story. 
because it's all A-type women, it's a marketing department. And if another girl, if another woman comes in, they don't have the same personality, they're just going to be chewed to bits. And I said, well, okay. So, you know, you guys, if you don't know me, you know me now. Because I said, all right, give me like three days. So I went out and I hustled and I thought, I'm going to get him a woman and I'm going to make him hire this person. <laughs> <laughs> and, you t and actually, it's exactly what happened. I met this girl. She only had like one year of full-time experience. She had some what they call co-ops in Canada, which is internships. And I just thought, okay. And back in the day when you do third party, you're contingency only. And I hate to say it, but it's true. You kind of have to coach your candidate a little bit because, you know, you kind of have something running on it. Whereas what I do, it's like, you know, it's a consulting fee regardless of whether you hire someone or not. So, you know, it's kind of, sometimes that can kind of be a great line. But we're trying to make you the best person we can. There's no line. There's no kind of fudging. But I said to her, I said, listen, this is what he said. Okay, so I need you to keep that in mind that, this, that he wanted a man in this position. What do you know? So I called him up and I said, She's coming out tomorrow, and she's going to be the one you're going to hire. And he said, mm -hmm. and I said, oh, no, because I'll never, I won't talk to you again. And guaranteed, this is going to be the hire. Now, of course, was I 100% confident she was it? No, but I thought, okay, she has the moxie. She knows how to put on the line, and she did it. And what do you know? She got hired, and this is, what, 10 years ago? And I just heard from her, like, last year saying, oh, no, I'm in Paris now, and I'm running some, I'm a VP of marketing for some big company in Paris, and... You know, if she hadn't have had me believing in her, and she had nothing. She had like eight months experience full time and like two years of internships, you know. But I just saw something in her and I thought, you know, I can see her. Like the question we always ask when we're getting your debriefing after interviews, we say, can you see yourself working there? So, you know, it, typical interviews. You go and you meet the manager, you go to office to office. You don't actually see the environment. Always ask to have a tour. Just walk through. You know, or on your way out, just pretend you're lost and go wandering <laughs> through. And like, watch people and look at their faces, see if they're engaged, if they're totally miserable. There's usually a reason, you know, and things like that. But you know, I After knew that. Day -to -day, you know, right. Day -to -day, what, what do you guys do daily? Like, come in, yeah. yeah. come yeah. in and see. You know, but that's what happened, and they hired her. And I swear, it was because I knew him and I knew her, and I said, I think you're just misinformed. That's one of the advantages, the biggest advantages for a recruiting firm is because of that personal relationship that the recruiter has with the hiring managers and the personal relationship that the recruiter has with the candidates, you guys. So, right. Um, and we try and put that together so we match people you know, as best we can. Yeah. Well, when, when they say they're unhappy, let me this out real quick. When they say they're unhappy, can they say, well, I never got a call from that recruiter? Because maybe there wasn't something right for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're just highly, you know, maybe you're just very different and they're waiting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want to give us a bad rap. You yeah. know, we talked to, we meet you, yeah, they you know. Didn't, they didn't call me They didn't call days. me, they stopped. Yeah. Well, maybe they're just, maybe we're doing you a favor and yeah. saving you guys from all these horrible, you know, mm -hmm. interview experiences. So we don't want to throw you into like an interview where right. you're not a fit at all and then you go, oh, I hate this recruiter, doesn't right. send me to the right place. So we're right. trying to at least, you know, get you something that you're interested in rather than just throw you. Know. Okay. So I also just want to, excuse me, sure. Bill, not to cut you off again. No. Um, <laughs> recruiters are good listeners, but we're great talkers. So we have to kind of get ourselves this up. I know you have a question and Bill has a question. Can we take Bill's question first because he got caught up at lunch? Absolutely. Okay. And then Taylor. Well, what was happening is when Shannon was speaking at lunch, um, I got the observation that what she was describing her job as was kind of like matchmaking versus the external could potentially be doing a temporary hire, more like dating. And I heard one of you guys mention dating as well. Right. So with following up on that, so Will, are you, are you, you're an external I'm and, oh, you're, you're Will, okay, I'm sorry, and you're Rodney? Yeah. Okay, so Rodney, are you the one that, do you do external and temporary? Um, yes. Okay, so everybody else does permanent, essentially, right? Okay, so one thing I was going to ask is especially for you because you're the one who does the, that part. I heard from another recruiter that things changed sort of drastically when the market changed. Uh, and part of that change in their perception was that people were, companies were less, uh, were more risk averse and they would do more trying before you're buying and they're liking this as an entryway into uh, jobs. Okay, I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Okay. Especially for entry level, junior, junior level positions, they, they like that. And we dab it under your resume as well, like a three month, six month contract for a lot of um, developers out there. So, are there particular companies that you guys potentially are the gateway for uh, permanent jobs too? Is it, I've heard some companies there that are specialize. Companies, yeah, there are a few companies that come to mind that were kind of the gateway for. Okay. You know. would, would you share that with a candidate? Um, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Because yeah. a lot of times, like we we're talking about, that positions aren't necessarily developer positions. They could be application support engineer, ah, which the good. next step is a developer. Right. Um, so it could be those types of positions. Right. So another gateway into the the, into the, the jobs, a gateway into the company first, yes. and then into the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, and Rodney might be a great resource for those of you that are thinking about, you know, contract or contract to, to firm or whatever. Right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robert Hobbs is a great a great firm that does excellent work. Um, they're more expensive than most of the others, but they earn it through good relationships. So that's one agency giving another one a compliment. <laughs> Competitor. Uh oh. Um, hey, I wanna, so, oh, and Will? Yeah, I just want to mention so recruiters can be great because they, they do a lot of research for you, but, but, but it doesn't mean that you have, that, that you could just use a recruiter and call your, your job search, you know, 100% handle for you. So there's a lot that you could do that, you know, on your own. You could, it depends on what kind of companies you're looking for. You could, if you're li interested in startups, you could network by going to Hacker News events. You could, you could read the tech blogs and check out the venture capital firm's portfolio and their news sections and see what companies they're making investments in. Um, you could, now more than ever, there are a lot of uh, meetup groups, a lot of different groups where engineers and tech types uh, just hang out. Do you have a website out. that you'd recommend? Yeah, I'd recommend the Hacker News Meetup in Seattle. There's the biggest collection of nerds I found in Seattle. <laughs> 250 uh, people show up to something every month. There's an event every month. And the good thing about that is that, so, um, there you can meet engineers who are actually working at cool companies and you can actually engage them in conversations about what is it actually like, what do you work on, what is the tech, what are you excited about in terms of, your company, in te in terms of their company's opportunity and you know, what, what it actually would be like to work there. And so you know, that's, that's the point. Anyway, you, you want to engage with your future would-be teammates. Mm -hmm. And so I'd recommend that. That's great. That's a great idea. And you can give your resume or your business card to the other engineers, and they can give it to their boss. And you can bypass the recruiters completely. Um, oh, yeah. It means, meaning you don't have to depend on the recruiters to get into those. You, that's a great way to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if you could have your, en your resume passed in by an engineer or some employee at the company that you're mm -hmm. you know, applying to, Ha to have them refer you in, that's an automatic plus 10 mm -hmm. for your application. That's almost every person you have dealt with. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And, Kara? Uh, so this question is specifically for Will. You are a developer who is now hiring. Can you tell me what insights you now have as a hiring manager into hiring developers from having been one? What did you wish you knew? What did I wish I knew? What did you wish you knew when you were a developer? Now you're hiring other developers. What do you wish you knew when you were a developer? That well, you know now? in particular about about us, I mean, we're, we're a startup. We're a total 16 people with a team of five engineers, and we're pre-Series A. What that means is we don't have very much money. We have a lot of equity to throw at people. Um, and it's a self-selecting group. Um, I actually never joined a pre-series A startup before, before GoFound anymore. And, and it's a pre-selecting group because you have, to be, you have to be interested in that kind of opportunity. You have to be interested in, and okay with the fact that, sure, you're, you're making a lower salary now and, and just gunning for the sky, basically. You have to be okay with the fact that you're going to be you're, you're going to need to be self-managing. You're going to need to be your own manager, so to speak. Um, you're going to need to be okay with, with what set, say somebody says, hey, build me this monitoring system to monitor our entire array of servers. And, you know, at, at a larger company, you would have an entire de sub-department managing that. Mm -hmm. and if, that's, that, if that sort of stuff excites you, if, this, if, the, if building a company excites you, then that's the sort of thing that you're going to do. Then, then maybe you've self-selected your, yourself into that group of interested applicants. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. How did you get your first engineering job and your second and your third? Like, what was your, what happened to you as a as an applicant or a candidate? <clears throat> well, in each case, I was referred in by an engineer okay. Okay. Uh, who was at that firm. Um, so, at my first job out of college, I was I learned I learned how to be an engineer there. I didn't I learned how to program in college, but I learned how to be an engineer. My first job, and then. Um, you know, after that, you just you, you you build a network of friends who go on out out and do interesting things. Um, you hear who's yeah yeah network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. you hear who who which companies are growing quickly, which companies have interesting things to work on, uh, which companies are paying more than what you're making right now. Mm -hmm. um, those were the things that. Interesting. So. Talk amongst yourselves and yes. learn about the industry that way. Mm -hmm. So network, your personal network has really been super valuable to you. Yeah, yeah. And find a mentor. I, I, I was just going to ask you that. It's like you read my mind. I wonder, do you have a mentor that has helped you, you know, even when you're not working at the same company as that person? Yes. And what kind of, how did you select that mentor and what does he or she do to help you? Um. It's really not that complicated. Um, it's show that you're interested in your job when you get there. Do your best to to learn. Every every new job is gonna have a steep learning curve. Try to get up as get up that as quickly as possible, and people will notice. Uh, software engineering is the most merit meritocratic industry out there. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether you have a college degree and then how old you are. You are, if, if the, the evidence is in the is in source control, you'll you'll see who's been making contributions uh, that that make a difference to the engineering organization, and and you know either your boss or some other senior engineer there, just make friends with them and they'll stay your friends mm -hmm. um, at that job and afterwards. I received great advice from each of them on on you know. <laughs> All sorts of things, including recruit, uh, applying for my next job, as well as how to run a startup. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, look for mentors. I think that's great advice. As a co-founder and you know executive in a startup, um, under what circumstances would you actually go out and ask for help from recruiting professionals like us? Um, and under what circumstances would you not? So, you know, you're probably in the not at this point. Um, but what, you know, just so that, you know, so the people here know, when I hear from a recruiter, it's because of a condition that's, that's true at the company. What, what are those conditions? Well, um, our company, we want to have, we want to hire <laughs> Go Dog, who do you like recruiters? So we want a recruiter recruiter to be in-house and and help us build our company and we have we have a bias towards that rather than using uh, contracted hire recruiters um, because because of the a subtle difference in incentives if we have a coworker whose full-time job it is to recruit then then we could find somebody who is like us culturally reflects our company basically it's just like me i think and accept their job is to recruit instead of to write code. And and those people, they will try to hire people to become their coworkers. They they live with their decisions as much as you know me as a hiring manager on the engineering team would with the live with that decision. Uh, versus versus let's say that we hire uh, an ex engage an external recruiter to find us two engineers. Um, if they find them for us, that's that's great, and you know their their incentive is to first and foremost place a candidate because that's how they get paid. Most most recruiters sounds like they're a bit different. So most recruiters they get paid when they place a candidate into uh, a company, and while they're interested in in placing good candidates so that they build a longer term relationship with that company, money today is worth more than money possible money down the road. So their first incentive is is to just get candidates in the door. It's actually, for me, it would be opposite because money today is worth more 
correct, but if it's it depending on the talent that we're using, like so if it's entry level developers, we're, we're looking to place you at a company that you may grow in rather than now, now if you guys are senior developers that, that have like so much under your resume, then maybe that hired gun type of mentality comes into play because you guys are going there for a one month contract, a quick contract, but if you're younger developers, we, we tend to look for companies like his, like startups, where you could actually grow and learn a little bit more. Because you learn more from a startup than you would from from a company, right. like a bigger company. So we understand that. So we try and put people that don't have as much experience in companies <laughs> where you can learn more, rather than throw you in a Microsoft or a bigger company where you wouldn't learn as much to grow your career. Because you know when you get your first job, you're already looking for your next job. And that's the way I see it with younger developers and new developers. I always tell them, you know, we get you this first job, but you're learning skills at this first job for your next job. So that's what I always try to say, you know, like when you get a new job, don't even think of it as your last. Think of it as you know, stepping stone for your next job. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's where I think I kind of differ or maybe like some recruiters kind of differ because yes, we are um, looking to make money because you know, that's what we do. But we're also looking to keep you guys as candidates, of course, in the future, like I said. Um, so it's just depending on the candidate. So if it's like um, you know more seasoned candidate, and of course, they're the people that are going to do the one week, two week, you know, right. remote hour jobs, you know. Right, and it does depend yeah. on the recruiter and the business model that their firm is engaged in. But I think the point is pretty clear that um, working with a recruiter is is sort of a sort of a necessary evil sometimes maybe and later if you need to pump up your candidate pipeline that may be where you have to resort but there's still going to be somebody at your firm whose job it is is to filter and to make sure that you're hiring the best for your company um, and so right so if you're not if you know if a company is has hired an external recruiter then you know that that the decision has been made for a reason but ultimately, a company like this one isn't going to just hire you because you're a warm body. And they're going to have somebody on the other side. They have the final word. No Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not all companies. Some companies are just hire warm bodies. And that's okay, too. Um, but it's not great. So um, we have five more minutes. So yeah, let's take your question. Um, my question is um, thank you guys for sharing your thoughts, too. It's really helpful. Um, I honestly hadn't really considered startups before because my guttural reaction is um, startups um, going under. And if, if you start with a startup, you know, the odds, I, I don't even know what the odds are, but it's just been in kind of ingrained just from what you read in the news, et cetera, et cetera. My focus has been to gain experience somewhere, in a, a short uh, contract job, uh, and then move on, as you were saying. But can you tell me, um, just from experience, that you, you know, you specialize with startups. Okay. The scenarios with that possibility, I'm sure there are maybe one one or two occasions where somebody's out of a job, unfortunately, sooner than later. Right, right. Well, I haven't experienced much companies going under. And I've been doing this about four years only with startups, so I can't say. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm really good at pegging the good ones. I don't know. But <laughs> there you go. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, when you start working with startups, you almost have to become an angel investor. You almost have to kind of put on that analytical mind and go, okay, what about this idea? Is this really something that's worthwhile? I mean, the founders, are they smart? Do they have a history? I mean, I wouldn't look at fear as being your motivator. I'd look at yourself first and ask yourself, am I somebody who is risk averse? If you're risk averse, don't ever do a startup. If you're somebody that wants to start a startup at some point, I want to add to what you had said, perfect place to learn how to run a company is to go work for another startup. Then you're going to decide, is all the blood, guts, and gore and the potential upside of the fame and the money it, in the learning, is that worth it? If your answer is no, 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 then don't even think about it. Because you can, here's the thing, the great thing about startups is that you can have an idea at any time in your career, you can be 70 years old and have an idea, and you become vastly successful at 70. It doesn't really matter when you do it. If you start with a startup first, if you're just kind of building your career and you want to start with a, com a small company, great thing is those big companies love that. They love people that are innovative, they love people that are forward thinking, that take risks, because what if big companies don't have, what don't they do well? Yes. They don't move fast. Why do you think they buy? I mean, here's the interesting part, I'm not sure if you guys touched on this. This is why big companies purchase startups. Why? For their people. 
they can't just recruit these guys because they have equity, they've got, you know, they've got vesting schedules, they have things they're working on right now. So what you'll see these in the, you know, you see this on, you know, Hacker News, you'll see it all in the papers, and you know, GeekWire will say, oh, you know, our company just got acquired. And you'll find out very, you know, slowly over time, you'll never hear from that company that the actual idea will be gone. It's the people they wanted. And so, we, you know, especially in the Bay Area, you call somebody up and you say, hey, I've got this great opportunity, would you talk to me? Well, I've got two years of my contract, and I can't leave, or else I'm going to lose, you know, $150,000. How did that happen? Well, they bought my company. So you basically sold your soul to be stuck at a company for two years. You, 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 know, you, you better have made some good money. Right, you know? that's Tara, that thank you. That is right. called an acqui hire. Right. Acquisition right. hire. Right. That sounds awesome. Um, right. Yeah. Also, I want to say, conversely, small companies don't really value big company experience if you're coming out of a, co a big company right out of, you know, wet behind the ears. Oh, I, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah. Okay, I was going to yeah. say, you might disagree with that. Some of the startup companies I work with, they mm -hmm. if they see a long history of big companies without any, um, any you know, startup experience in there, it's it's a little scary for them, especially people coming out of Microsoft who are used to a huge infrastructure, and sometimes it's hard for them to make the transition. It takes a little while to wash Microsoft out of your hair, but that's just my experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to right hear. I mean, are you seeing? <laughs> 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 well, and I think this is our last like comment, right? Because we got to wrap it up. But I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, I, I. Because I have some great Microsoft people I can show you. We got one already. Great. Well, I've got I some more for you. I'll give you a discount. <laughs> well, it's it, it's hard to find a good job, and mm -hmm. it's uh, at least the big companies they're known quantities. Yeah. Um, and another thing that's good about big companies is that you they they probably work. They're probably functional companies. There are a lot of dysfunctional startups out there. There are a lot of startups with garbage business models, um, or just you know no no process. At the big companies, you learn mm -hmm. you learn what functional processes look like. Probably, mm -hmm. maybe maybe some mm -hmm. yeah. There are exceptions, but you know at least there are more known quantities. You learn you learn things like testing and code reviews and like mm -hmm. how to behave professionally. In a, you know, <laughs> beha behave professionally in, in a workplace. Uh, you you, you probably have experience uh, uh, interviewing people and mm -hmm. screening resumes. These are all things that are you'll you'll probably have a better chance learning them at a at you know maybe a two undersized startup mm -hmm. and up or big company mm -hmm. uh, that you might not learn if you just went from. 50 person startup to fail 50 mm -hmm. person startup to mm -hmm. third, you know, if you go through a string of failed startups, you probably you are in a bad place. Fail. You probably learn how to fail. Yeah. Unless you're a co-founder okay. and then you just, they see you as somebody who keeps going and they want to fund you despite the fact that you've had two failed startups, right? Yeah. But that's, that's, that's kind of anomaly in our industry. Yeah, so. yeah. See, that's, that's an optimistic way of looking at it, but it's, it's more nuanced than that. Yeah. People like to fund people have gone from success to success mm -hmm. to success. More than they like to fund people who have gone from failure to failure. They actually like to see a little bit of success in the right? Having a little bit of both is good. Because not everything always turns out great. I agree mm -hmm. with you. I love your perspective on that. Thank nice. you. Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah, startups is not, a startup, startups are not a career. Like, tech is a career. The point of a startup mm -hmm. is to say, not be a startup as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, right. That's yeah. a very good point. So we're wrapping this up, folks. I do want to. I want to finish with one comment on the the perspicacity of the folks you've been listening to right here. Will said earlier, say, does, he was joking right there. Said, say, does anybody here have a solution on synchronicity among web caches? So, uh, how many people in here know the answer to that question, or at least have something they can say about it? Does anybody in here have anything they can say about it at all? In the future, you do. Okay, and you do? Okay, why was your mouth not open right there? <laughs> open your mouth and say blog post. No, 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 right then, right there. Open your mouth. Yes, you want him to know immediately, I've written a blog post, I've got a solution on it. And you know why? You are here to create your own opportunities. He's not coming to you. You are walking up to him, you are making noise and making your own opportunities. And now, after we let these fine folks 
mix among you and, and pick you off like gazelles. <laughs> Before we do anything else, we have got to thank these people. Thank you so much for your perspective, for your time. Thank you very much. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to our Kickstarter backers, Michelle Thickpen, Annabelle Richard, Tech Liminal, and Adria Richards. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our Kickstarter backers. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you.